1.7% year on year and taking the total converted users delivered in the full year to 105.3 million. Our tech enabled platform focused innovations as part of Apple 2.0 strategy played out really well in FY 2021. We successfully integrated our platforms, teams, and IP portfolio to unlock innovative vernacular consumer experiences and deeper verticalization across key customer segments. We also augmented our mobile OEM and operator partnerships to power an open internet connected ecosystem play. This has further strengthened our consumer platform and enabled greater ROI impact for our advertisers. Our efforts towards enhancing our human resource capabilities and building on-ground local presence in some of the international geographies are also paying off very well and driving traction for the business. Apple platforms have been consistently recognized in the industry as top performers and were recently awarded 51 wins across categories and geographies in the latest edition of the App Flyer Performance Index 2021. Apple continues to also be recognized as a great place to work by the Great Places to Work Institute in 2021. We take pride in our values to build an inclusive culture that boosts innovation, collaboration, learning, fun, and entrepreneurship. We thank all the investors and shareholders for their support to our strategic fundraise process. We had an approval to raise rupees 1,080 crores, of which we decided to allocate rupees 600 crores in QIP. We see this underpinning our growth and global expansion plans while we continue to evaluate credible inorganic opportunities that shall further enhance value for all our stakeholders. We also remain in deep gratitude to our teams whose endless support, even in COVID times, led to our all round consistent performance. Apple has been highly responsive in ensuring its employee safety and also contributed in well-governed COVID relief funds to support the community at large. With that, I hand over this discussion to our CFO, Kapil Bhutani, to discuss the financials. Thank you, and over to you, Kapil. Thanks, Anish, and a very warm welcome to all the participants on the call. Wishing everyone a good day and hope uh, you all are keeping safe and well in this COVID times. Continuing our year on year growth momentum in financial year 21, the company reported revenue from operations of rupees 5,108 million, a growth of 54.8% by one by. Our Q4 revenue stood at 1,416 million, a growth of 76.9% by one by. Our EBITDA for the year of financial year 21 increased by 46.4% by one by, while the Q4 EBITDA increased by 63.4% by one by. Although the third quarter in the year is the highest quarter due to bigger seasonality driven by festive season, and therefore Q4 and Q3 uh, sequentially will not be a good way to analyze. However, if you just compare the OPEX sequentially, our overall OPEX has come down. Our implied cost sequentially was stable. Our data inventory cost in Q4 was at 57.4% of the revenue from operations versus 57.9% in Q3 and in line to the Q, Q4 last year. Our minority investments have done well. We have exited invest scores while continuing to be invested in uh, talent unlimited, that is global AI. We recorded a gain on these invested investments in Q4. Pursuant to the introduction of the finance bill uh, 2021, we had one-time tax expense as deferred tax liability on goodwill amounting to 11.52 million in Q4 and 14.18 in financial year 21 due to change in the tax base. To provide clarity on our business operations, we have normalized profit after tax to mention one-time items in our earnings presentation uploaded on stock exchange and company's website. Our normalized profit after tax for the year was rupees 1031 million an increase of 57.4% by and by. Our profit after tax for quarter four was 265 million, an increase of 73.6% by and by, without adjusting 
one time item as discussed in our ppt our profit after tax uh, without discussing our adjusted profit uh, without adjusting our profits for the one time expenses our profit after tax would have been much higher we remain focused on working capital management and our collections had been robust since the year our cash flows from operations was 1030 million for financial year 21 of iron y growth of 43.4% and adjusted operating cash flow to pack ratio was 100% with this i end my presentation and let us uh, open the floor for questions thank you very much ladies and gentlemen we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touch tone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and 2 participants are requested to use handset while asking a question ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue is assembled the first question is from the line of hardik sangani from icc security please go ahead yeah hi hi everyone so just a couple of questions so in terms of uh, the newer uh, privacy changes uh, for example in cohort based advertising for by google so uh, what can what is the possible impact uh, that can come toward uh, in terms of advertising as a whole in a general industry and if there is an impact on how we uh, do our operations uh, secondly uh, just wanted to get a break up of organic and organic revenue on yoy basis in q4 and uh, and overall for fy21 uh and uh thirdly uh sir so the uh, uh, in terms of investments uh, in uh, by the qit which we have raised so are we looking in specific segments uh, to enter into yeah that's it from my side from now thanks for your question i will uh, take some parts of the question and let kapil complete uh, you know any parts that i'm not addressing for you so with respect to uh, you know whatever uh, google is doing i think we have already mentioned before uh, you know as part of several uh, you know conversations that we are not a direct competitor with respect to google in fact uh, on the contrary most of the advertisers uh, typically you know split their budgets for advertising on digital very differently in marking certain parts of the budget that go to google or facebook or their related networks and the teams who are looking at those budgets are also typically different from the teams that are looking at the non google non facebook part of the pie and the non google facebook part of the pie continues to consistently grow and most of the you know analysts even in developed markets where digital advertising is a much bigger part of the total advertising pie have already clearly opined that you know the non google facebook part of the pie is in fact growing at least as fast if not faster than the overall digital advertising pie so we are also seeing similar dynamics in emerging markets and uh, in fact we are also partners with google the advertisers who are working with us can take some parts of the budget and uh, take some of the google and facebook budgets and channel to our platforms to deliver conversions overall so i think we have absolutely no issues or concerns with respect to you know whatever google and facebook might continue to do as every platform should continue to innovate and uh, and evolve i think at this moment we are absolutely fine with uh, coexisting and the addressable market is very very large and it's always been the case for last 8 years i think the dynamics in the markets are well settled and we are not kind of uh, you know head on competing uh, per se with google or facebook in this uh, market dynamics the third part of your question which is related to qip and you know strategic investments going forward uh we are definitely uh you know showing that as a company we have delivered on a successful track record of doing not only mnas but also minority investments and we are extremely prudent in how we manage our investments integrate them and turn them around from where we acquire them to becoming much more profitable much more growth oriented companies powered by our tech and ip integrations with them and so this is a very clear formula for us to continue to grow our company and the qip was also premised on that for not just uh, in organic growth but also in organic growth and expansion plans of the company so we are looking at expanding into new geographies and also doubling down on our two v's and two o strategy in existing markets and as and when we find the right uh, target companies and there are many that we have always been evaluating and we have always had very long courtship periods with any company that we have actually invested in or acquired so 
you know, at least uh, two to three years of long courtship period before Apple actually signs the door line. So, you know, we have a mature pipeline and as and when the right deal dynamics uh, emerge and we find the appropriate candidates, we will do the, you know, disclosures and announcements for the inorganic plans. In terms of the mix of revenue, organic to inorganic, uh, I think the last uh, year has been a phenomenal success for us on all fronts. And we have, you know, I'll give a qualitative answer and let Kapil give the quantitative one. So qualitatively, we have put every single business that we have, every single business unit that we have on a strong growth trajectory and also ensured that on a you know per business unit basis we are able to ensure profitability and cash flow positive uh, you know performance and that i'm very very proud of because you know when you acquire companies and you will turn it around i think we have consistently shown a very strong track record on that front now over to you kapil to you know give some specific numbers perhaps uh, you know with respect to uh, this quarter on organic versus inorganic thanks Anish. um for this quarter, we have about 18% contribution coming from uh, inorganic and about uh, just above uh, 7% uh, to the bad contribution from inorganic. Uh, this is uh, we are just uh, this is contribution of the app next acquisition which was done last year in June. Uh, Media Smart is was there in the previous quarter, so it is uh, it is an organic it is a part of the organic growth. Thanks. Uh, just one follow-up question to that. So Q4 is typically uh, like we experienced a greater decline in the past. So in this quarter, actually, we, the signal effect has been quite lower. So any specific reason for that? Uh, sure. yeah, let uh, me take that. Uh, Kevin, let me take that. So, so actually, the October, November, December quarter is typically the highest uh, 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 quarter for any advertising company business. We are no different. And if you see the last three years trends in our next presentation, you would see that this is a consistent pattern. Now, uh, October, November, December is uh, in 2020 because of COVID was also a little bit uh, more balanced out. I think we shared that in the last earnings call as well that, you know, the, of course, the advertisers put bigger budgets in that time because of Diwali and Christmas and school holidays and so on. But, you know, this year they, they balanced it out a little bit between Q3 and Q4 and uh, that was anticipated and this is uh, what we are seeing at this moment. But having said that, I think the overall um, growth momentum of our business in Q4 has been really strong on all parameters, you know, consumer platform business, CPCU, non-CPCU business, existing markets and new markets. I mean, it's been uh, all round positive growth. And that's why in Q4 you see the CPCU uh, growth is over 80% on the number of conversions that we delivered. And that's really, uh, you know, b boosting our confidence that, look, you know, everything is going well across industry verticals, across existing and new markets. And, uh, you know, I think we should we should just see it on a standalone basis or Q4 to Q4 basis for a deeper comparison and not really spend too much analysis on Q3 versus Q4 uh, for this time. Yeah. Okay. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rishit from Nomura. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, so co congrats on a decent quarter, first of all. Uh, now just to a uh, couple of questions from my side. First on the uh, growth in the next year, right? Um, how, how do we see growth in the next year panning out, right? Uh, will it be, because, because some of these markets will start to recover in, term, in terms of spending, right? We've got some of the international presence that we started to invest as well. Uh, so how do we see the growth between international and India one, uh, between mass and retargeting second? And what are the key drivers in each of these markets that you would sort of attribute for the next year? That's the first question I'll, I'll, I'll answer. I'll ask the second one later. Uh, thanks, Rishit, uh, for that question. See, typically I've always uh, stayed away from giving, you know, short-term guidances, uh, but the outlook for the immediate next year as well as for the next five years is extremely optimistic at our company. Let me give you some macro insights on that and then I will drill down further uh, on our specific situation. In terms of emerging markets, specifically in India, the total mobile marketing spends as a percentage of the total advertising spends is roughly around 20 odd percent. If you look at the developed markets today, 
most of them, the mobile marketing digital spends are already at 50% of the total advertising spends. What does that tell us? It tells us that we will see a similar pattern or an accelerated pattern of growth because of COVID situation as the advertising spends in emerging markets, India as well as others, move from the 20 odd percent of the total ad spend to 50%. And this will definitely happen in the next three odd years, is my opinion. Now, given that opinion, our outlook is extremely optimistic, right? Because the advertisers have no choice but to spend on mobile and digital smartphone connected devices in order to get the attention of the consumers. The consumers, on the other hand, have actually accelerated their adoption curve, right? With respect to all kinds of lifestyle services across our categories, E, F, G, and H, which are e-commerce, entertainment, education, financial services, food tech, FMCG, government, gaming, groceries, healthcare, and all of these categories contribute over 90% of our revenues. The adoption of the consumers on these categories is going to continue to increase and they will do more and more conversions, new conversions, repeat conversions, online and offline conversions, and so on. So we will see all round very balanced growth across all of these parameters. Now, in terms of specific uh, clarity, right? Ever since we went public or even prior to that during road shows, I've always consistently committed that we will deliver at least 25% CAGR growth over next five years. And I've always been asked, as the base keeps changing, Apple has grown substantially since IPO over the last two years. And now with this new base, are we still seeing commitment to you know year on year as well as CAGR growth for next five years, about 25%? And the answer to that is a firm yes. So I would see 25 to 30% CAGR growth for our company over the next four to five years, and that's largely anchored on the fact that the macro factors are playing with massive tailwinds and lifts for our business for the continued momentum to be delivered, especially across emerging markets. In terms of India and international, your specific question to Apple, where the balance is right now about 50-50%, we see that India will also continue to grow quite nicely, and international markets would grow not only in line and ahead of the average growth trends in those markets, but also because we are relatively smaller in those markets and the number of geographies is quite a number. And we are a global platform. We have no restrictions in which geographies we can deliver business in. Of course, you know, it takes time to go and build teams in those markets. But one would say that going forward, the shift should be in favor of international markets growing faster, possibly in the 60-40% range as we go to the next year or so. And find a certain balance over time. But you know, every time I think of that and I model that for our company, I'm also surprised by how quickly and how deeply we are able to grow within India on vernacular verticalization strategies and eventually end up with a better balance in favor of India. So you know, I, I would say that um, uh, long term, whether in the next few years or so, the balance will shift in favor of international and uh, that should certainly happen. I hope that answers uh, your question. And if it doesn't, uh, you know, perhaps we will take it up in other questions as they come along. Uh, no, it, it surely does to some extent. Uh, just just a little more on that one, right? Uh, what are the other geographies from an international market that we're planning to get into? That's one. And then within those geographies, right, uh, we'll be much smaller in terms of presence, right? What are the two key, three, two or three geographies, right? Key ones that we sort of planning to become much larger in terms of size where we could have a dominant presence similar to where India is today for you guys. In in any of, color there should be actually markets. Yeah, in terms of emerging markets globally, we think that in a matter of time, we have the right full uh, business plan and business model and technology and team-based differentiation to establish, you know, number one, number two, or, you know, the top few kind of uh, market leadership position within most of the emerging markets globally. All right, so that's how I see Apple's strategy. India, we're already there. Let's make sure we achieve that in Southeast Asia, Middle East Africa, Nepal, and you know this will be both organic and inorganic, and we must make sure that we execute on that focus on emerging markets. But as we do that, we're also seeing very interesting opportunities to enter into very interesting niche uh, positions in uh, developed markets, right? And whether it's North America, Europe, or Japan, Korea, and so on. So I think we are... We are placing very calibrated bets, and we are seeing a global opportunity for our business where market leadership in India should give us a very clear right to establish market leadership across all emerging global markets, because India is one of the toughest markets in the emerging markets in the world. 
And if we are able to do that here, absolutely no reason why we cannot do that in all other global emerging markets. And it will go in sequence, Southeast Asia, Latin, Middle East, Africa, and some order in the next few years, we should be able to achieve that. And we are also not leaving developed markets out of our purview. You know, we're just saying that, okay, in developed markets, we're not trying to get in there to become market leaders, but let's go and, you know, very niche certain verticals and segments, let's make sure that we're giving the, the more established players in developed markets a run for their money because we are exceptionally competent to do live a business in, in developed markets as well. Okay. And, and that will be largely, the developed market strategy will largely be driven around app next, media, smart, uh, essentially, and not run mass, I would presume. Is that the case? Or is not the case. No, not the case. See, every, every of our platforms, you know, and capabilities is equally relevant globally. I mean, it's not that some platforms are only for emerging markets and some are for developed markets, but uh, uh, we, may, we may deploy a different strategy. So when you, when you go in, let's say, into a new market, we may choose to enter with, you know, a particular uh, set of strategies and weapons, let's say, versus another. So we will always optimize and say, let's go in uh, with with one and then everything else follows behind it. And those execution strategies, I will not uh, want to limit ourselves on, you know, which way we go first. But, you know, all our platforms are given the prioritization that let's dominate emerging markets and let's also keep a uh, corner of the eye view on developed markets and execute on them, you know, as the case might be. But we're not limiting any of our platforms from the global uh, possibilities that have that all these platforms have, and we have deep execution capabilities. And if you look at our management team, we have a very global management team. It's by no stretch of imagination, you know, limited to any particular geography. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that, that was very detailed. And just the second question that I had was on the risk side. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, the couple of risks, right, around privacy, around how Google and maybe iOS change their policies, right, uh, on, on the unique ID that they sort of put out and then how they change how apps have to sort of collect data, etc., and keep notifying the users, right? Uh, how do you see the ecosystem changing and responding to that, and how are we placed in terms of investments? Because I look at, let's say, some of these players like in Mobi, right, uh, which uh, one of the competitors, right? So what they try to do is they try to get into a more data strategy that they try to own the data by, let's say, getting into products like lands, et cetera, right? Uh, what, what is our strategy, and how do we think we are placed in, in that ecosystem? Thanks. Sure. So, uh, first of all, uh, we have to look at the fundamentals of the business model that is already at play. Whenever advertising is happening on digital, it is almost always uh, happening at the uh, benefit of the consumer getting a service on, a, on an app or a website, either free or subsidized, right? So, that's the reason why the consumers would typically opt in. Now, whatever iOS and Google are doing, they're just basically saying that we need to ensure that the users are opting in much more clearly and they are being informed much more clearly by each of these apps, which are saying that we will deliver ads to you. So the opt-in has to be done properly. And we are very well supportive of that as a, you know, as a industry that to progress that, hey, the consumer should know why am I giving consent or not? Now, all of us as individuals on our own would have seen that when you're using an app or when you land on a website, it says privacy statement, kindly accept, kindly move on. And I mean, 99.9% .9 of the times, if you want to access that app, you just want to, you know, quickly accept it and move on. And that's the behavior pattern of all consumers. What we're also seeing in the U.S. is that on iOS 14, and we have some business in the U.S., and we're able to take some of the data that we have uh, and sample it on a you know, statistically valid sample size to see that a good number of consumers are actually giving consent for a good number of apps and services. So I think the ecosystem will fundamentally need to go back and say, are the consumers willing to pay and therefore not give consent and not see ads, or are they going to give consent? Now, here, the most interesting point is, that the developed market consumers will behave slightly differently from emerging market consumers. I can tell you that any sample A-B testing that we have done, emerging markets, India, or any other emerging market in the world, if you go and offer somebody, hey, this is an ad-subsidized app, versus if you reject the consent, they're going to get a more expensive version of it or something, the consumers in emerging markets are more than willing to give the consent. We are not so stuck about, you know, hey, hold on a second, this is my data, where are you taking it? Of course, segments would be of consumers, but a large segment is not. 
And once the consumers give consent, then you know, it's business as usual. The consumers who don't give the consent, there are other ways of behavioral targeting as long as you have statistically large enough samples of users who are whose data is being processed through the system. And if you're able to run your algorithms, you can say that, okay, if user A is behaving in a certain way or a device A is behaving in a certain way, and I have no data on that, right? No deep data on an individualized basis, but I have some cohort-based broad analysis, then we should still be able to do meaningful sort of uh, advertising on that, uh, on those devices as well. So at the moment, I would say that we are uh, not seeing any dramatic changes in emerging markets happening because the AV iOS impact is very low in India, uh, in other emerging markets around the world. And Google hasn't really you know, followed uh, behind iOS uh, uh, so quickly. And I would think that Google will probably take another two to three years or more before they you know, follow on iOS 14. By then, we should have already built a fair amount of uh, you know, adaptation with respect to these changes. So I don't see any immediate impact. Otherwise, I would have not been so optimistic about my forward guidance you know, for next three to five years. And uh, very importantly, our OEM and operator strategy adds another layer of defense on this because the OEMs and operators have a lot of autonomy with respect to Android devices, especially in emerging markets. And when we partner with them and make them a stakeholder in terms of the monetization possibilities of advertising revenue in this ecosystem, then we get a lot more sort of deeper insights. In terms of gaining access to data, so like you said, Inmobi is you know going out and doing something like a glance and working with OEMs for one of the products in one of the ways. I think what happened, and they are more going in the content, right? They're going more into you know like the TikTok path with Roposo and so on. And I think what Apple has done instead is we're going deeper on the utilities, like the keyboard, for example, right? And we're going deeper on investing in that and owning in that and monetizing in that and therefore gaining deeper insights. Now, let me just give you one simple insight. A keyboard on a device is used more than 120 times by each of us on an average per day. Across every single app that you have on your device, the keyboard must show up. But the minus one screen or, you know, some other sort of content screen, that's that's very limited touch point with that. I mean, even if it is somebody is viewing that uh, video content for 15, 20, 20 or 30 minutes in a day, that is still a very, how do I say, you know, one context of the experience. Whereas the keyboard is used across all kinds of contexts of the EFGH categories or even more. And therefore, uh, our approach and strategy on that front is actually very sound with respect to vernacular verticalization deeply uh, within India as well as elsewhere. So that's the reason why our continued investment in, um, you know, Bobble. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, these are just uh, some, in, some insights into our strategy and we're, we're executing very deeply on our two O's, OEM and operator partnerships, and two V's, the verticalization and vernacular strategy for emerging markets. So we, I think we have a very, very good handle on where things are heading and uh, a very clear strategy to continue our growth journey. Um. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants, Please limit your question to three per participant. You may come back in the question queue if you have a follow-up. The next question is from the line of Manisha from GC Capital. Please go ahead. Manisha, you may go ahead with your question. I'm unable to hear Manisha in case she's on mute. There's no response from the current participant. We take the next question from the line of Murudul Shah from Amara Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Anuj Kapil. Congratulations for a fantastic year. Uh, Anuj, my question to you was, how do you see the ad tech market shaping up in the broader sense, especially with respect to the efficacy around the targeted marketing? And obviously the privacy issue you had answered in a, question, in a previous question but still wanted to take your thoughts. Uh, do you really see the, you know, the digital ad space market continuing its, uh, you know, effectiveness? It might sound weird, but in one of the articles I was reading, you know, they were comparing the ad space market, uh, the digital ad space market to the subprime crisis of, uh, you know, 2007. Uh, you know, any thoughts on that? How do you see this shaping up in the broader sense? 
Yeah, I think the the writing to me is very much on the wall uh, with respect to the two macro factors that the advertising must only happen where the consumer attention is and the consumer attention you would never be able to disagree with me even as an individual is deeply on the smartphone connected devices you know we are not watching any other medium tv print radio i mean any other medium is is falling short by a mile when you compare that to digital uh, consumer attention on digital connected devices and especially when you see it from the lens of two particular consumer segments one is the youth right from my daughter who's 6 years old you know uh, the you know they had no interest in uh, in anything but a connected device you know from media consumption point of view mm-hmm. or when you look at rural audiences because of affordances you know they will say that this is the only device that they would invest in and use for all forms of lifestyle business needs as well as personal entertainment or consumption so there is no doubt in my mind that the advertisers have no option but to spend on digital advertising now the efficacy of digital advertising with consumer privacy taken care of is a very sensible balance that needs to be achieved and the government acted on that right? they said that there needs to be data privacy laws you know there has to be personal data protection act it started in singapore it started in europe it started in us even there the consumers had a you know regulatory right to give a consent or to withdraw the consent and that consent was being managed in a broad basis and now ios 14 uh, especially impacting more developed markets has said that the consent has to be much more explicit and all of these trends have already been behind us i mean more or less i mean ios 14 is still you know the verdict is to be you know see that to be out but i think for initial trends that we are seeing you know this is not going to stop the advertisers from spending more of their digital spends uh, or more of their advertising spends on digital and it's certainly not going to stop the consumers from using the services that they want to use without paying for it by consenting to take ads so i think i am reasonably confident on the macro factors in terms of how exactly will this uh, pan out and you know what will happen with google and facebook see google and facebook are in a in in a bigger sort of an issue in if i may say because they are advertising companies later but first and foremost they are consumer services where they are directly taking a lot of data from the consumers and they are always under the radar whether it is from regulatory perspective or frankly if i may say ios 14 what I, apple is doing is much more targeted on google facebook than anybody else so so i think the the competing forces as well as regulatory forces are going to trim or contain the availabilities or uh, you know abilities of uh, the larger players in the market and the rest of the players will become beneficiaries of that right because the budgets would spill over in greater favor of the open internet ecosystems and that's why you're seeing in the US i mean where which is the largest digital advertising market in the world there's so many listed companies in the space and the analysts and all of them are super bullish on that even with 50% of the market being exposed to iOS 14 So you know I think I rest my case there I think the macro factors are supportive and in emerging markets is very android heavy Google is a completely digital advertising sort of business model focused company they are not going to do something that will derail this business ecosystem and in partnership with OEMs and operators we also de-risk ourselves substantially from you know anything that Google might do on its android platform because when you partner with the OEM you get on device insights um uh, which doesn't necessarily require google's permission per se right because it doesn't go through the google play store uh, ecosystem uh, all the time so i think this is uh, this is how we are keeping ourselves fairly balanced i've been running this company for 16 years and i've seen uh, uh, i started uh, apple in 2005 you know before google before apple launched anything to do with android or ios respectively nokia was king blackberry was cool and we've seen massive shifts in the ecosystem but what we have not seen any change with is the consumer adoption for mobile devices has only grown and the advertisers adoption has only grown so what happens in the middle with the rest of the ecosystem may fluctuate but apple is uh, extremely uh, grounded in our entrepreneurial resourcefulness and we know how to maneuver and deliver value and growth in this uh, ever changing ecosystem to fair point completely agree uh just a quick follow up on that so let me ask you from the other side what does give you sleep less night you know do you fear any technological disruption or do you see any new synergies coming into play how do you see you know what what gives you sleep less night sorry for asking this question you know you can choose to answer as less words as you want 
well i deeply care about my team and people and you know see the numbers are ironically for our business covid no covid is always growth oriented and strong right i mean there's no doubt in my mind that we will continue to deliver you know financially strong performance but what i care deeply about and not able to solve for my team is when their families are un- unwell when my team members are unwell and you know how do you how do you lead in that time with empathy with concern and i think that is uh, that has been you know causing me some un, you know unsettled uh, ness and feeling of uh, you know uh, sometimes you just have to surrender because you know not everything you can control and you just because you're the ceo or the leader or the chairman you know you can't solve every part of the puzzle some things you just let happen and uh, just pray and hold on to things and you know so we lost one of our colleagues last year and that get got me you know really impacted and i think this year we've lost so many family members of colleagues we've had no loss of any apple employee but uh, you know a lot of family members have been impacted so what i'm coming down to is as a culture you know how how can we be as a thriving culture where we take care of our team carry everybody together as stakeholders not just help them in their career growth but also in the wealth creation journey and i'm extremely grounded on that right in terms of sharing and carrying everybody along together right so you see that throughout covid we didn't have any cost cutting or some something that would be unfair to the you know employee stakeholders and in, in, instead you know if you see on the opex side you know we've consistently make sure that bonuses are paid everything is going on time in fact we are going and you know paying advances to people whose families are affected and so on giving you know loans from the company if need be uh, so so that culture of the organization is what i deeply care about so today we are almost 400 people strong across so many geographies making sure that uh, when people are not coming to office how are they still feeling connected you know and uh, so so i'm really deeply invested in making sure that we build a very solid culture of togetherness and and care so that people know that um, if you stay at apple when apple is growing we will all be growing together and our families will be safe and taken care of right that's great to hear uh, you know thanks anuj and uh, wishing you and the team all the very best that is all thanks thank you the next question is from the line of vikash mystery from moonshoot ventures please go ahead okay anuj i have two questions first one is that uh, i want to know understand about connected tv strategy which uh, actually is quite exploding and revenue our from them are increasing much faster than mobile advertisement and how we are trying to tackle that sure so on your first question the comment that you made is largely true for north america as one of the leading developed geographies and it is not entirely true yet for emerging markets like india and so on where uh, connected tv is at a very nascent early stage and apple has already launched its product for and propositions and partnership strategy for connected tv already it's very very early stage but i think we are uh, watching that space very closely with an emerging markets india specific and other emerging markets specific lens and uh, i'm very comfortable with where we are in this space so we're not reacting to it um, uh, with uh, you know uh, in any delayed fashion we've been proactive we're early and we're investing in that space as well so i think very very comfortable with that i do see it as a uh long term uh, growth story even in emerging markets but unlike in developed markets where it is on the bigger tv screen the connected tv i think the you know we are still going to see a lot more mobile uh, based consumption of ott as the uh, radio so there's multiple ways on how you define connected tv and i think this is a, a massive uh, opportunity for growth and we are eyeing it and investing it holistically and it's on top of the game we have a dedicated team which is just looking at that so we we should be just fine okay that's that's helpful next question is on your data costs are quite higher as compared to global peers and because we are using cpc method and going forward would you think that with operating leverage and as algos and data richness will increase can we hope that the lower data cost will happen and as algos become more efficient the uh, data cost in any emerging geography will be relatively higher and i'll tell you why because we have a much larger population in emerging markets we have a higher per capita usage of mobile apps and devices in emerging markets versus every right so the the unit economics of let's say what is the value of one users conversion in india versus the one users conversion in north america 
Now, then compare that to, okay, what is the average data being generated by a user in North America versus an average user in India? You will find that the per capita data generation in India is larger than the per capita generation in developed markets. And that's because, I mean, uh, data plans are cheaper. People have, you know, you know, a lot of time. There's a lot of people and there's a lot of time. This is in developed markets, relatively speaking. The cloud computing costs, right, the server's cost on, let's say, Amazon Cloud, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Cloud, they don't say that, oh, if the server is or data is coming in from uh, Indian devices, they're going to charge us lesser for processing on bandwidth and server processing power compared to, you know, if the data is coming from anywhere else. So when you talk about large, scalable, you know, humongous volumes of data, especially India, and on low unit economics of revenue, I think when you take it in context, you'll find that Apple is exceptionally competitive and has a really, really strong unit economic model here delivering profitability, which, by the way, is a big competitive advantage when we go into developed markets because, you know, we will find that we are getting paid more, our cost is lesser, our profitability could be higher, but, you know, we have chosen to fight the battle uh, for various reasons over the last seven, eight years in emerging markets and we slowly open that uh, competitive advantage in developed markets as well over time. Okay, last question from my side, uh, that we have done acquisitions of Media Smart and Appnex. They are somehow newer businesses, their rows are quite low, and we have uh, improved them beautifully by their margin expansion and all that. So what would be our strategy going forward in terms of acquisitions, whether we are going to buy out some mature businesses or trying to um, buy out some Salesforce kind of acquisitions or something, capability kind of acquisitions? I have already uh, mm -hmm. shared multiple times that our inorganic growth plan is grounded in yeah go ahead please yeah yeah i've been talking for too long we uh, have seen our uh, uh, acquisition uh, strategies over the period of time we have acquired more technologically uh, focused but geo focus was the second reason but as we grow forward the geo focus would be a uh, main dominant factor for us uh, yeah, then the technological factor because we have all the uh, ingredients in our tech platforms right. at the moment. And uh, I would not like to elaborate more on this at the moment because uh, we have stated that this is going to be a way forward strategy also. With limited uh, information uh, being given to you is that we'll be more geo-focused than the technology focused. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Hello, operator, we can't hear you. In case you're on mute, could you, you know, guide us to the next question, please? Hello? Uh, since we're not able to hear anyone, it seems that uh, the Hello, sir, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. The next question is from the line of Mayan Babla from the Lalan Virtual. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Congratulations, uh, on a great uh, year of uh, Great FY21. Uh, thank you also for the uh, clarity on the iOS and Android privacy issues uh, that you will have to report for. Uh, just uh, extending to that, I, uh, I, had a, I had three questions. One, uh, and uh, one is divided into two parts. Part A is basically, do you see the accuracy of uh, advertising, mobile advertising reducing over the next two, three years as more and more privacy uh, uh, norms are released. Uh, as you said, uh, Google will take another two to three years to, uh, you know, uh, uh, reach that stage. So, do you see the accuracy of these uh, ads reducing, thereby uh, uh, impacting uh, our realizations or increasing the acquisition of data costs? This is my first question. All right. So. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, I see that especially in, uh, first of all, you know, our must, I must say that uh, based on the way our business is calibrated, anchored on emerging markets, we are deeply uh, Android skewed, okay? And in that sense, we are also very, very insulated 
uh, with respect to you know what is happening in iOS 14 in developed markets specifically, because iOS has very little uh, exposure or uh, market share in emerging markets, and so we are deeply insulated from those changes, and that gives us a huge advantage and privilege because we are able to analyze what's happening in iOS 14, and we can build models, predictions, action plans with respect to what might happen on Android if this were to be done in a few years' time on Android as well. Now, Android and iOS are very different ecosystems because iOS is completely in the control of Apple. Apple can make any change that they want. Whereas in Android, they have to, Google has to work with OEMs and handset manufacturers because each of them uh, have their own varying levels of control and autonomy with respect to what they do on their devices. Now, Apple is already deeply partnering with operators and OEMs uh, across emerging markets. And therefore, we are making sure that we have uh, you know, much deeper sort of capabilities and insights with respect to any future changes that might come. The second difference between these two ecosystems from a larger uh, emerging markets versus developed markets perspective is that the consumers, people like you and me, are much more uh, amenable to giving consent and having a cheaper ad-funded experience then let's say in developed markets, there would be more proportion of users who would say, no, I'm ready to pay, but I don't want to see the ad. And I think in that sense, in emerging markets, I expect much higher percentage of consent versus in developed markets. And therefore, once the percentage of consent reaches a certain statistical threshold, then it doesn't really matter because our system doesn't work necessarily on each individual device. It actually already works on aggregated insights because you'd be surprised you and I may have never met, but you and I might be behaving so similarly on our mobile connected devices. Um, you know, so, so there are basically a few hundreds of you know, consumer segments and patterns which most people conform into. And as long as you can gain that level of statistical valid uh, sensible uh, capabilities, then the systems would basically work and perform and would not see any efficacy uh, issues. So I hope that answers your question. I'm pretty confident that, A, the changes on Android and emerging markets will take uh, quite a fair bit of time to happen. And even when those changes happen, the OEMs and operators would have a say, and we, in partnership with them, would have an ability to gain deeper insights. And finally, the consumers will be, there will be enough and sufficient statistical sampling of consumers who will be giving consent because of the fundamentals of achieving a cheaper ad-funded service versus a uh, you know, non-consented, non-ad funded premium service. So I think, you know, I'm not so nervous and I'm definitely not losing sleep on this particular point. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, answer. My uh, second and third question regarding uh, the what would, what would be the latest employee count and when will the next wage hike cycle be? And the third question is uh, regarding the finance cost. Uh, it's slightly uh, uh, spiked in this quarter, so if you could uh, just uh, give a, throw some light on that. And last, thank you for the contribu uh, the, the detail on the next uh, acquisition. If you could just uh, give the EBITDA margin profile in this quarter. That's all. From me. Kapil, let you answer these three questions on employees and uh, you know any appraisal cycles as well as the finance costs and EBITDA. So, uh, as Anush mentioned, that we have 400 plus employees around the world today. Uh, the appraisal cycle, major appraisal cycle, will happen in October. Um, we had shifted the appraisal cycles uh, last year for uh, unifying it to October. We had two appraisal cycles earlier. We, we have now unified it to the October cycle. But anyway, uh, there would be some uh, minor uh, employees who are who have got some, uh, sorry. Uh, small percentage of employees who have got the increments in the April cycle also. So you will see that effect in the Q1 also. On uh, the uh, the question of EBITDA margins, the EBITDA margins are about 18 to 20% on uh, the uh, the athletic side. So and the finance cost. Okay, on the finance cost, uh, there are two elements to it. A, the financing uh, was taken by the company to do an acquisition of AppMix last year, which was about uh, $10 million uh, in Singapore. Uh, that was uh, disclosed last time. And uh, the, the cost is coming on, from that side. Secondly, the, uh, the contingent consideration which is to be paid over a period of three years on these acquisitions are discounted for fair value and present value and the cost is 
reflected in PNL. This uh, this is a non outgoing cash, uh, but this is accounted for as cash as an invest item for the present value of the liabilities due for in future more than two years. Okay, thank you so much, and best of luck for the next year. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, most of my uh, question has been answered. Just uh, one uh, question, if I could give any clarity on is the inventory rates and eventual CPC rates in the domestic market. Uh, are we seeing uh, any uptake, downtake uh, on, on these parameters? Uh, are uh, check suggests that uh, inventory rates in general are going up. So are we getting uh, commensurated with higher CPC on an incremental basis? And secondly, uh, yeah, the impact on Apple section in the non-India market, of course, we understand uh, the India being largely uh, Android market, but uh, overall exposure for us on the Apple section. Right. Uh, so uh, first of all, on the uh, CPC rate, you can see that we have been holding steady and our strategy is very clear that we are going for volume and scale and growth because when we do that, we automatically derive uh, you know, certain efficiencies along the way. And we're not trying to change our CPC price too much and giving you know, higher ROI outcomes and benefits to our advertisers across industry verticals. In terms of the inventory rates, I mean, I don't see, uh, as far as we are concerned, this uh, observation that the inventory rates are going up. Uh, that I don't believe is true, and uh, we have leverage because we are a larger player in emerging markets, so we will be able to continue to keep our uh, margin profile intact. So, um, you know, uh, other international markets uh, as well, if you notice that our business is disproportionately focused on emerging markets, and we do uh, very little business in developed markets. Uh, you know, so the exposure on iOS would be not more than, you know, 5 to 10%. And even on that five to ten percent, because we are so small in in that uh, in those spaces, we do believe that we have already got the necessary innovations and you know initiatives to keep our customers continue to spend on iOS because the uh, consumers are not going off from iOS and the advertising budget still deserve to be spent on iOS. And um, there is also an opportunity that if any advertiser is trying to switch iOS to Android a lot more on their advertising budgets, then again, they are quite strong. So we can either switch them from iOS advertising spends to Android in those markets or find ways to upsell more because we haven't sold enough in developed markets yet. So, you know, I don't see us uh, seeing any material impact with respect to iOS 14 changes. And uh, in fact, on the contrary, we might even be growing uh, better than some of the other competitors who are deeply seen as iOS 14 developed market players versus we are seen as experts on Android from emerging markets and you know our solutions can be uh, sold much more aggressively in developed markets, uh, especially when iOS becomes a little bit of uh, a doubtful area in case the advertisers are rethinking we have a better chance of winning larger budgets for Android there. So we should be fine. I'm not nervous about it at all. Yeah, and uh, lastly, if uh, you can give any data in terms of the uh, subsidies of the uh, acquired entities, what are the revenue and the big bookkeeping ones? Can you elaborate your questions further? Yeah, I mean to say, uh, uh, any revenue we want to give on the uh, acquired entities. Uh, it could see entities, media smart app next in uh, Discover. Uh, so the, the quarter uh, for the uh, app next is about three and a half uh, million, and the quarter for uh, quarter four for media smart is about uh, one point five million. And Discover. Yes. Discover Tech is uh, negligible at the moment. Uh, we don't expect. Uh, as previously told, we expect uh, revenues to flow from Discover Tech. It was a pre-revenue company, uh, pre-revenue acquisitions, and uh, we expect the revenues to flow from Q3 onwards. Right. And lastly, uh, if I may, uh, uh, on this uh, Indus OS uh, uh, kind of a uh, transaction, uh, have we uh, received all the money and any rational uh, we would 
uh, give in terms of why uh, we have exited this uh, uh, right uh, on uh, buying it back uh, in just matter of two months of uh, doing the transaction. So, as uh, on Interpol, as we had briefed it on our previous earnings calls, also the reasons for exiting, we had kept it because we anticipated a certain growth and uh, realization of certain profits uh, uh, in the in this investments, and uh, we believe that uh, we have uh, it is the right time to exit with the rights and the kind of valuation we were getting, and we have exited and made the profit uh, where. Uh, we think that this is the optimal thing to do at the moment. Uh, the rationale was provided in the last call that we are seeing this as more as now. Uh, Apple was seeing this. Apple India was seeing this more as a financial investment, and uh, we we as a strategy are more uh, strategic in nature. And uh, as and when we thought that the 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 gains are enough for us to realize, we have done that. Okay, but what was the urgency of uh, exiting the rights as well? I mean, we kept it for one year and two year option. Uh, so you're just saying that the price was uh, too good to catch up on. Yeah, the price was good uh, to catch up on. And uh, okay. we, as we move and build uh, our cash uh, for future growth and investment, I think so we realize uh, on the timing and as well as cost and cost and benefit analysis. Right, right. Uh, I mean, the the reason for asking this is, uh, of course, we made a strong uh, money on the uh, overall investment. There's no question about it. But uh, when parent entity uh, uh, is uh, based on media article is acquiring more stake in the same company, uh, I don't understand uh, the the difference in rethinking about the potential of the business versus what. The parent is thinking about the same business when they are acquiring at much higher price and much higher stake. As answered, uh, Apple is more investments are more strategic for furthering the business cause, right? And Apple Holdings may invest for financial gains, right? So we have uh, opportunities to deploy money in more strategic uh, regions also. So we have paid our uh, gains versus the potential deployment for the further uh, for the times to come. And we don't see. Uh, I think it will be it will be fair to mention that if Apple Holdings is doing any uh, investments, it's uh, you know it's their own thesis, it's their own sort of uh, decision, and in the Apple India earnings call, it would not be appropriate to uh, let's say discuss that or allude on it. But it would suffice to say that the holding company and the promoter group is deeply invested in Apple India and would not do anything which would harm Apple India's interests. In fact, from the contrary, any strategic uh, possibility with any other company that Apple Holdings may have invested in would 100% accrue to the benefit of the list core. So the, as far as uh, the list core is concerned and Apple India group is concerned, we must make sure that our financial and strategic interests are always kept intact. And as far as in this OS transaction is concerned, the financial interest has been fully realized and uh, it is material and therefore the board decided in its favor. As far as any strategic uh, spillover effect or positive effect, Apple India would continue to be uh, the beneficiary of that if it were to ever come with respect to any investment that the promoter group may have done. Yeah, I appreciate it. Just to continue the same thought, any comment you want to say on Bobble AI, how this investment is shaping up and what are our strategic thoughts on this uh, investment? Yeah, so Bobul AI uh, is doing really well and we are very bullish and confident about uh, both the financial uh, as well as the strategic gain that Apple India Group would buy from it and we are uh, very happy with this investment and are looking forward to continuing it for the longer term. Much appreciated. Thank you and best of luck for the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Devang Bhatt from ICICI Direct. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Thank you for taking my question. I just uh, wanted to know, see, this quarter our organic growth was approximately 45% YOY. So are we being conservative in saying that we might grow 25-30%? Secondly, our ethnic margin are still at 7%. So when do we expect to reach the company level margins? And uh, in Q1, uh, some states were having uh, a ban on e-commerce uh, selling non-essential. 
so any impact of that or any impact of uh, employee extremism uh, extremism uh, on q1 Kapil, do you want to take this question, please? Yeah, uh, I'll take the first question. There is no, uh, there is no employee absurdism. Yeah, we had a list of uh, people having, uh, or their families having affected in uh, the month of April. But as of now, uh, uh, the employee strength is fully back, and this impact was more, more so with the employees based out of Gurgaon rather than any any other part based in the India also. Uh, can you repeat your question because it has three parts. Okay. Okay. And any impact of that uh, non-essential ban for e-commerce? Yeah. So we have not seen uh, any major impact, which is material, uh, during this period. Uh, yes, there some adjustments would have happened uh, during the uh, quarter for uh, the budgets allocated, but we are not. There is no indicator to us that there will be a major shift in strategy at the moment. And the uh, app next margins, uh, when do we expect to reach the company level? Secondly, the uh, probably so, uh, Michael. Okay, sorry, I'll uh, ask a little later. The second. Yes, no, no, I'll just give you an answer. Uh, on the app next margin, you have to realize that uh, when we acquired this, this was almost a uh, return uh, company. And uh, we have got the company in one year has turned around and very favorably. We have to be a little more patient uh, before the uh, 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 for higher margins on this. But the reason that it is more uh, uh, targeting on the OEM and operator strategy, which would uh, need a larger time frame to reach to what the overall company level is. Right. So we have been able to successfully turn around the company to an acceptable level uh, for year one, and uh, we want uh, our investors to be a little patient uh, for year and a half. For seeing better results on Apex side. Okay, and uh, this this quarter, as for my calculation, your organic growth is 45 percent. Why, why, baby? So, are you being conservative in seeing that only 25 to 30 percent growth, uh, or? Okay, we are not conservative as uh, previously stated. We have always said uh, around 25 percent, and the statement this year has changed from 25 to 30 percent. So, there is an indicator. Uh, of the the confidence we have, that we are still measuring the long term impacts, how it will pan out before giving the uh, firm guidances uh, going forward. So we would like to reserve uh, the the guidances for the uh, next few years based on the current trends. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashwin Mehta from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, so, couple two questions uh, from you. One, in terms of uh, capitalization for development of, of, of platforms uh, this year as well as this quarter, uh, and how do you see that uh, going forward? Uh, secondly, in terms of, uh, uh, while well, Anuj, you talked about the growth expectations of 25 to 30% over the next five years, uh, what are our margin aspirations uh, uh, as we see possibly higher international growth, which should be accretive? Uh, and over this period, you also see some catch up in terms of uh, your investments in AppNext and all uh, uh, catching up in terms of, in terms of margins. Uh, and the third question was in terms of uh, the platform as a service offering. Uh, so how has the take up uh, on that been uh, for us? Thanks. Kapil, you want to take the first one on capitalization. I'll take the second one on, uh, you know, margin and growth. And and then the so, third so, one we can yeah, talk about. Yeah. Thanks, Ashwin, for asking these questions. Our, uh, my answer would be that uh, we, are on, we are on the similar lines as last quarter. But yes, we are rushing on certain uh, initiatives to complete it faster. So the investment have, uh, will be little high, have been little higher in Q4, and it will be little higher in Q1. We are trying to close our uh, initiatives uh, by Q1, Q2 uh, for a larger growth, uh, and uh, taking the, uh, the the tailwinds uh, which are there uh, to be more effective for us. So we are rushing in to complete the projects a little uh, faster. And uh, with that effect, there will be a so there is a slight uh, increase uh, by 10% on capitalization from Q4 to Q3. But from Q3 to Q4, we had about 
million uh, capitalization Q3. Uh, it is about 1.55 to 1.6 million, and uh, we are just rushing and investing so that we can take advantage of the situation at the moment, uh, which is uh, which is making us uh, we are, uh, very bullish for the near term. Thanks, Kapil. Uh, in terms of our overall, uh, you know, growth and margin expansion uh, possibilities from the businesses that we already have, right? I mean, in terms of the organic growth, we are uh, very clear that every acquired business that has already been successfully integrated over the course of two years or so, we will be able to bring it to similar levels of bottom line and margin efficiencies as our, uh, you know, organic business has been. And we have already demonstrated that over time because with, uh, uh, you know, fair number of acquisitions, we are consistently performing, not just in terms of growth and, you know, pricing, CPCU, margins, and, you know, bottom line performance has been uh, uh, quite uh, resilient overall. And uh, going forward, as volume of business grows, right, we would expect that uh, uh, to also continue. But we are, we have to be seen as a, you know, a growth-oriented company where we are also consistently investing not only in our tech platforms, but we are also investing in, in on-ground presence across new geographies and so on. But you know, even with all of that, I do expect that we should be able to achieve a similar, uh, you know, track record of continued performance. Um, the only criteria that you need to be, you know, watchful for is that when we have uh, further inorganic acquisitions, we will again have those same cycles of, you know, acquiring companies that are perhaps not as efficient and acquiring them as value-based transactions and then transforming them with our tech and capabilities and efficiencies and processes a much higher level of, uh, you know, uh, uh, value creation. So, and there is always going to be that gestation period. So let's say we do another acquisition in a few months' time, and then we turn it around over the next two years. When we consolidate that together with us, you will see the, the bottom line margin, you know, on an adjusted basis. That hey, organic business is doing performing in this way. The new acquired business is at lower margin. So it will be more mathematical modeling uh, that uh, hopefully the the analysts of the various investors would be able to do as and when we you know do further acquisitions but on the organic business uh, theory and the businesses that are already acquired and integrated we're already well on our way to deliver uh, great efficiencies from uh, profitability and cash flow positive execution there and your uh, final question was around uh, the sorry, platform as a service uh, offering that's right. So on platform as a service offering, we have been uh, uh, very clearly watchful and we have, uh, you know, got some good success and some early proof of concepts, you know, where we are in discussions with customers, but it's not material yet. You know, it is still going in the omni-channel and enterprise side of the non-consumer platform business at the moment. And we are, you know, carefully uh, evaluating that opportunity. I see a big possibility there, including in developed markets. Uh, but given our execution focus, sales teams, relationships with customers are in emerging markets. We are already trying and talking to several customers, and there are early proof of concepts that we have already done with some of the customers. So it's positive, but it's not a substantial part of our revenue mix at the moment. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, and Thanks for your insights. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, that was the last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference back to the management for their closing comments. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the call today and for all your questions, which were very insightful. And I hope our, answer have, our answers have given uh, you a comprehensive understanding and insight into you know, how the outlook for our business remains extremely optimistic and bullish based on the macro factors of consumers adopting and converting more on digital connected devices as well as the advertisers spending more, especially in global emerging markets where Apple aims to be a market leader uh, as we continue to keep our execution focus there. And also having the adjacent opportunities in developed markets where we believe our platforms and management have, you know, capabilities to compete there meaningfully. And, you know, so all round, when you look at on the balance of things, Apple remains um, uh, focused on sustainable, continued cash flow, positive, profitable growth metrics, and we hope to unlock great value for stakeholders. 25% uh, to 30% CAGR growth on uh, next five-year broad basis on a larger base that we are at today, 
is a conservative but an important commitment from us and we will com continue to execute on that business plan and deliver growth and value for all of you thank you very much for joining today and uh, and stay safe thanks everyone thank you on behalf of icacs securities limited we conclude today's conference thank you all for joining you may now disconnect your lines